DJ O, I appreciate you, man. Thanks for getting us started. Welcome everybody for joining. Uh, my name is Jacoby Holland. DJ O, what's up, man? Chilling, man. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be back. Feels Good. great, you know, doing the Zoom DJ sets again. <laughs> <laughs> Always a pleasure to have you. Always a pleasure. Thanks for setting the vibes. Uh, well, Lulu, how you doing? I'm good. Super excited for the series that we have. Um, so welcome everyone. Jersey's in the house. New York's in the house. Uh, Pennsylvania. We've got Florida. We have DC. Am I missing Let's anyone go. else? That's a lot. Uh, Massachusetts. Um, I'm going to say shout out to all of my Brooklyn people. 16 years now in, in Prospect Heights. Um, so welcome everyone. This is um, our uh, community series. Jacoby and I have an education platform. It used to be an in-person events platform in New York City called On The Revel. Since then, we've created a series called Dope People, where we feature amazing people in the cannabis industry. And now since New York, New Jersey, the East Coast is heating up with cannabis, we're doing this education series. So thank you for joining. Um, Jacoby, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Lulu. Um, yeah, once again, I mean, thanks to everybody for joining. Thanks for being a part of this. Uh, cannabis is really heating up this year. Uh, 2020 was crazy. There's a lot of reasons for this to exist and you know, hopefully it's for the right reasons. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over in a minute, but before I do, I just wanna thank our partners for making this happen. Um, like Lulu said, we're Revel, but uh, we couldn't do it without Canaclusive. They really held it down to help us put this together. And then of course our sponsor, Cole Shots. Uh, really appreciate it. It's hard to find good sponsors with, uh, you know, people that you want to partner with long term, and, and these guys are amazing. So, without further ado, I want to introduce Shirali to the stage. She's been holding it down for New Jersey, and she's a founder of Blaze Responsibly. Shirali, what's up? What's up, Jacoby? How are you? It's always a pleasure to hear your voice. I'm going to turn it over to you. Educate the people. Let them know what's happening in New Jersey. And then I know we have some other panelists coming on afterwards. Yeah, for sure. I have like a little uh, presentation put together. I promise it won't be boring. It's really just to give you an, a high level overview of where we are in New Jersey and kind of how we got here. Um, really quickly about me, born and raised in New Jersey. I am an attorney. I started my career working for government. I used to be a prosecutor, currently practice federal class action litigation against big pharma. Uh, the national opioids case is one of my matters. As far as cannabis, um, I've always had a love for the plant, but in the past five years, I got more invested, ventured out to Colorado, made contacts, and just really started networking. And in 2019, I submitted an application in New Jersey as the president to obtain a vertically integrated medical license. And so things are on hold. Obviously, I'll get to that. Um, but having navigated the process, understanding the politics in New Jersey, I decided to start my own company called Blaze Responsibly, trying to educate and empower the next generation of leaders in this space. Um, I was part of NJCAN 2020 Vote Yes initiative. I'm also an executive board member for the Cannabis Law Committee for the state. So I'm, I'm here to really just share some information and hopefully, um, you know, educate everybody that's listening in today. So let me share my screen and hopefully everybody can see this. All right, cool. So really, you know, New Jersey's had a medical program since 2010, uh, but it really didn't get ramped up until recently. And obviously adult use passed, but it's still not legal. And so I'll get to that. Okay, so before 2018, um, it was actually Governor Corzine who the last day of office out of spite maybe decided he was gonna legalize medical cannabis. And so it was really difficult because as you can see the conditions that were covered, you basically had to be terminally ill or you know suffering from cancer, uh, some sort of disorder that was a difficult threshold to meet. And for an operator, you had to be a nonprofit entity. And so when this, when it was first legalized, we had six entities that were licensed to be vertically integrated so they can all cultivate, manufacture and dispense medical cannabis. But we really didn't see the program taking shape until recently. And so this hey, is, from, these, these are the original. I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. I can only see your title slide. 
And I think you were going through slides. Can you see, hold on. I know you're on a roll, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Let me, let me stop sharing that though. And let me try again. Sorry for that. Can you see my screen now? Yep, perfect. All right, cool. So these are the original six um, ATCs is what they call them in New Jersey, alternative treatment centers. Um, all but one would be considered an MSO, a multi-state operator. And so they're all, these are all currently operating facilities right now. Um, that was the program up until 2018. In 2018, when Governor Murphy came into New Jersey, he decided he wanted to expand the medical program. And what that part of what that meant was the existing six operators were allowed to have up to three additional satellite locations. Some of those original ATCs have taken advantage of this. The nonprofit status was dropped, which as you can imagine, they were super happy about. Uh, conditions got added, which made it easier for more patients. And another RFA or another round of applications was issued. So this is the 2018, this is the first public you know, request for applications. And this was also for an additional six licenses and it was only vertically integrated. So I'm, I'm showing this slide just to give you an idea of what the applications used to look like for medical. It looks like not much, there's three criterions, but within these three criteria, everything else is broken into this. So you have to have like your security plan, you know, your workforce diversity plan, your funding, all, all of the above. Um, there was a lawsuit that happened. So there were six winners. These are, the, these are the six winners. And lawsuits happened because somebody who lost claimed that the scoring was all over the place. Well, recently the New Jersey courts decided the scoring system was flawed. They didn't tell the Department of Health what to do, but basically they agreed that the, that the scoring was all over the place. And so that's just something to think about, you know, moving forward. The, the way that the system works is flawed. And so unless, and every point matters. And so when you're putting together your team and your application, just be mindful, like things can go wrong. And I'm gonna to get to that because of 2019. And so again, with 2018, you can see the winners, all MSOs, pretty much all of them are operating in some sort of capacity now in New Jersey. Then 2019 happened. And in 2019, we had more reforms. Uh, opioid use disorder, chronic pain, migraines, anxiety were added as qualifying conditions, which increased the patient count, obviously. Um, and then out-of-state patients are also eligible now. And home delivery was allowed. None of the existing operators have yet to take advantage of home delivery. So hopefully we'll see that come to fruition. And the most significant thing was that now licenses were going to be awarded for cultivation, manufacturing, and dispensary separately instead of all being packaged as a vertical. And then shortly, like three weeks after this bill was signed, that's when we had another request for applications. This, as you can compare to 2018, looks a lot more different, right? They've changed some of the criteria, they've added things, the scoring's different. And in this round, the Department of Health was looking to award up to 24 licenses, 15 dispensary, five cultivation, and four vertically integrated. This is the round that I applied with my team for one of those vertical licenses. We're almost 18 months later and we still have not heard any results because this round is tied up in litigation. Just this past Tuesday, the Court of Appeals heard oral arguments and they haven't issued a decision yet, but we'll see what happens. There was a total of 191 teams that applied in this round. 51 were disqualified for various reasons and the ones that are suing were disqualified because their PDFs had technical errors and so the state didn't accept it. Um, you know, this is something to keep in mind because this doesn't help the small entrepreneurs and the small businesses, right? It's only benefiting those who are well capitalized because think about having to hold on to your property for 18 months, right? On a conditional lease, for example, or holding on to funding. So another thing to keep in mind, have a reserve account set aside if you're really looking to get into this industry from a licensing standpoint. And then obviously adult use happened, right? So fast forward coming into 2020, Adult use was on the ballot and much like every other state, except for, I think Vermont maybe did it legislatively, but adult use on the ballot is typically always successful. And for New Jersey, 
it was no different. 67% of our population voted in favor to legalize adult use. That was in November and we are now in February and we don't have adult use legal. Okay, so that's where we are. Right now, all we have is pending legislation. So November 3rd, people voted, we wanna see adult use. Now what has to happen is that an enabling, enabling legislation has to be passed so that we can see adult use come to light. Senator Scatari, who was the prime sponsor of legalization in the first place, first place, pushed his bill, which was S21, and then the complementary bill in the assembly, A21, was released. I testified in Senate on S21 to have an equitable marketplace, to ensure that revenue went back to the communities, and to have equitable licenses, but it doesn't seem like any of that mattered because S21 and A21 are really lacking. Um, they spell out, you know, categories of licenses. They talk about the Cannabis Regulatory Commission to be formed, and they do mention micro licenses, though they're not defined. They're just defined as far as, you know, how many square feet you can grow or how big your retail can be, but who's eligible is poorly defined. Social equity applicant status isn't defined in there, and so there's a lot of work to be done, but nonetheless, S21 and A21, the legalization bills and the decriminal decriminalization bill did make their way to the governor but then what happened was governor murphy said i'm not happy with these bills because one there's discrepancies and two they don't address underage use and penalties and so the noise in trenton was that he's going to issue a conditional veto unless there's language that he likes um so past week i think it was last friday assemblyman benji wimberly he's a democrat he introduced this bill, A5342, which was a cleanup bill. And in that bill, he, he, it passed assembly and it said that 18 to 20 year olds would only face a fine for possession and under 18 would not face a fine, but they'd rather get a point of violation warning or juvenile intervention. You know, it's not perfect. A juvenile intervention basically means that it's a written agreement with conditions attached so that law enforcement won't pursue delinquency. Um, and a warning is just a warning, no formal court, but there's already implicit biases in the system. And so it's going to be interesting how this happened, but assembly passed the cleanup bill. So now they, there's supposed to be a full vote in, in the assembly on February 8th. Ideally, the Senate will pass an identical bill the day after because they also have a meeting. Once the cleanup bill passes, the chances are very likely that Governor Murphy will sign off finally on the legalization bill and decriminalization bills so we can stop arrest and we can see our market come to fruition. But that's kind of where we are. I know I talked a lot, um, but I'm, I'm trying to educate everybody on where we are. And so let me stop sharing my screen now. What I do wanna do is I wanna invite all the other panelists on because I wanna start moderating this panel that we have tonight to really dive a little bit deeper into not just New Jersey, but also the other East Coast states. So. We have Chris, Jeff, Robert, if you guys want to turn on your screens and unmute yourselves, please. I will let you guys uh, introduce yourselves, so, like keep your bio short, maybe 30 seconds or so. And Chris, we'll start with you. Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for hopping on tonight. Uh, my name is Chris Alexander. I currently work uh, for Village. Um, it's a company founded by Al Harrington, a New Jersey native. Um, that is uh, you know, really a primarily entirely black owned, black operated cannabis company operating in a couple of states right now. Um, I previously worked for the New York State Senate uh, for the Drug Policy Alliance um, and you know, was the architect of the Start a Smart New York campaign to uh, end cannabis prohibition uh, in New York. Um, yeah, we'll keep it going from there. That's amazing. Robert? My name's Rob DePisa. I'm an attorney at Cold Shots. I got my start in cannabis, my first cannabis client in 2013. Um, did a couple rounds of applications in New Jersey and uh, across the country and uh, just uh, following my passion and passion for the plant and uh, happy to be here. And Charlie, great summary. Very good job. I just wanted to say that before we got started. Okay. Appreciate that. Jeff, last but not least. Hey. How's it going? Um, so I'm Jeff. Uh, I'm a corporate securities attorney based in New York, um, partner at Forrestine Kulik. We're a, a 24 attorney law firm and dedicated exclusively to cannabis. Um, <clears throat> cover really every aspect of, of the industry. Personally, my practice focuses on representing uh, um, operators and investors in the space. 
And um, the work ranges from everything from M and A to uh, different rounds of financing, from you know seed round stuff to IPOs, uh, and everything in between. And then, um, of course, state regulatory work. And uh, I think for the next couple of years, at least, uh, a lot of this practice is going to be focused on uh, what's going on in New York and the East Coast generally. Absolutely. Well, I'm great to have you guys here and moderate this panel. You know, before I switch over to New York, because I think New York, New Jersey are both competing equally for attention tonight, in addition to the other states. But why don't I get your your feedback, if any, or comments, and what do you think is going on here in New Jersey? You know, why do you think um, the stalling tactics have happened? You know, any, anybody can hop in, but I, I, I wanted to get your insight on that. Well, I'll kick us off. Um, well, first off, I'm surprised that the issue that we have in front of us right now was not previously discussed. And obviously, there's been a bit of a stalemate between Governor Murphy and Skateri for some time now. So, you know, they butt heads before. This is no different here. And, you know, the sad thing is it's a stalemate, but the only people that are suffering are the residents of New Jersey, because what we're about to feel right now is the squeeze, right? We had this opportunity where we could have been first to market and every single month counts when you're first to market because you can count on that. Um, uh, you're gonna have the uh, individuals coming from the neighboring states into your state to make purchases which equal tax dollars. But we've lost some precious time over the past couple of months. And now you see Pennsylvania and New York heading full steam ahead for you know March, April, they're gonna make it a part of their budget. So. We're losing valuable time and dollars for the state. Yeah, no, it's really terrible. And you, and you brought something up about, you know, the what happens to the medical market and what are the yeah. implications, you know, for patients? Like what what's the incentive to continue participating as a patient when adult use comes to like, can you guys maybe speak to that a little bit about what, you know, what's happened in other states, for example? Hey, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, if I could jump in. I mean, I think that if 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 a state is not intentional about trying to protect the medical market, um, it will it will deteriorate. And what that means and how that shows its face is not just in you know you know making sure that the product is tax free, making sure that there is a higher quality of, of a skew of products available for patients, making sure that patient advocacy and patient input, uh, the process for patient input is still included, making sure that doctors who are uh, prescribing or registering patients are still included in the process. All of that has to be done intentionally in order for a uh, medical program to survive. Now, one thing that, you know, coming from uh, DPA and the, the advocacy background that I have, you know, we were very clear that the patient advocates were some of the you know, most vocal, most passionate advocates that were ever in the room. And by keeping them centered in the conversation, we were able to each step along the way as we traveled through decrim and now to adult use, to make sure that the patients were being heard and centered. One thing that we heard, you know, intently from patient advocates uh, was that, you know, they wanted to make sure that there were still spaces where they could go, um, where they could still hear and get to receive a doctor's input, make sure that the dispensaries that they would, would visit would still have some type of medical professional um, on board to provide some level of consultation. So I think some of these other, not necessarily market variables, but some of the other um, facets of a medical program are the things that keep patients engaged. And if, honestly, if those things aren't prioritized as you move forward away from medical and into a broader adult use market, the, the medical market will, will collapse. Yeah, I, I agree. And you know, maybe we can, before we do get back to the state issue, can we comment on what we think the future of the medical market is in general? Because I personally feel like the future of cannabis is in medicine, right? We're not there obviously because of federal legalization, but I'm sure big pharma is waiting. They already have plenty of patents. Um, and so I'm just interested to hear your take because the US is, is behind as far as other countries are concerned with R&D, given that we haven't been able to do that. But you know, talk, walk me through that. Like, what do you guys think like the medical market looks like five, 10 years down from now? I don't think anybody knows um, to start, right? Uh, but but we can <clears throat> we can try to take a, an educated guess as to as to what could happen, and there are a lot of potential outcomes. But just based on where uh, Washington is today, um, trying to read through Biden's very very thin um, and vague plan, uh, trying to figure out what he what the plans are there, 
Um, he's talked about rescheduling medical cannabis. He's trying to, he's, he's articulated this concept that I can't really wrap my head around, which is this dual path schedule two for medical cannabis and a state's act approach to adult use, which I just don't, I, it's hard to, I don't understand how that will function, but there's a pretty good chance that we see cannabis on get, schedule two, maybe schedule three at some point for, uh, you know, for medical purposes. Uh, what, what does that mean? Uh, that could be catastrophic for the existing market as it, as it <clears throat> exists today. Um, because not, no, no medical cannabis operator uh, currently is a pharmacy and no product sold in a medical cannabis dispensary is approved by the FDA. Um, so both of those are disqualifiers completely. So um, rescheduling cannabis to schedule two or even schedule three, should that happen? I, I think it, that just that idea poses an existential threat to the, the, the state legal medical market, right? So it's possible I could see, I hope this doesn't happen, but I could see if, if they go down that road, um, state you know, medical operators would have to convert into adult use or they're gone. Um, they're not going to be selling FDA approved products. And <clears throat> we, we have to stop that from happening. So just as a threshold matter, anybody kind of cheering on the idea of rescheduling cannabis to schedule two, please stop. That's like terrible. That's the last thing we want. We're all going to be talking about something else next. If that happens, we're all going to be uh, out of business. So I, I definitely don't want to see that happen. Plus it's not full-blown legalization. Um, anything subject to schedule two is still subject to 280E, which is absolutely terrible as well. Um, so we don't want to see that happen. I, I think, I hope that, uh, you know, reason and logic will prevail, but again, this is politics. So, um, uh, there's clearly a lane for medical. There's no question. GW Pharma got bought out, uh, I think it was this morning or maybe yesterday. Um, I know it was just Groundhog Day, but it feels like that often for most of us. But, uh, you know, they, <clears throat> there's clearly a medical lane here. Um, and, and it's going to look a lot different than the CPG aspect of this industry. But how that all plays out is um, obviously TBD. Yeah, and I agree with you as far as rescheduling. You know, I'm not a proponent for rescheduling either because then it remained un under the purview of the FDA, which if we don't know already, you know, news alert, it's controlled by big pharma. So just, you know, my two cents. Um, you, you, and since you mentioned federal, everybody is obviously, you know, aware of the, the plan or the soon to be plan that's gonna be released that Senator Booker, Schumer, Wyden have committed to. And so what form, because we, we went through this, but maybe Chris and Robert can add to it, you know, what do you think federal legalization may look like and what form is ideal for the states that are already existing and you know are we going to see the interplay that we have with alcohol where states get to do their own sale and distribution like so just give me your opinion charlie that's a it's a great question and uh I think when it comes to, I mean, my biggest concern for federal legalization and the way I think it would be done wrong, right, is if you were to permit existing operators, let's say in Colorado, New Jersey, New York, to cultivate cannabis in an area that probably makes a little more sense when it comes to agriculture, where the labor is cheaper, the land is cheaper, what that's going to end up doing is essentially gut these, you know, um, adult use markets that are already up and operating because they're going to lose jobs, they're going to lose tax revenue. So I think it's key that you need to preserve some kind of um, uh, intrastate ecosystem when it comes to the adult use market for each state. Otherwise, you know, I think the states are actually going to find themselves fighting federal legalization if that's the structure. And you brought up a good point you know, when it comes to the way alcohol is regulated on a federal level, and that would make sense. But from what we've seen, none of this makes sense, right? They haven't treated cannabis like alcohol any step of the way, even though there's a lot of situations where it should have been. So if we look and history tends to repeat itself, chances are they won't take that route and they won't treat cannabis the same way as alcohol. And we could end up with a mess. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I will add to the prediction that this is going to be a mess. Um, I think the, obviously what we all want is for there to be some type of hybrid approach where we get, you know, federal 
uh, uh, descheduling, some guidelines to states who have not started their own programs and a, a strong uh, stance of respecting the existing programs um, with, you know, additional, uh, you know, federal clearance of records, you know, directions to create a, you know, a federal fund, all these things that were incor incorporated in these different bills. I, I just don't see it. I don't understand. I, I, I think that we start in a place where the state's programs are respected. Um, and then we quickly transition to a place where the federal government recognizes that some of these state programs um, have been provided corruption, are not functioning properly, and, you know, provide an additional, you know, kind of separate licensing criteria that happens on the federal level. So, I mean, I, I'm very concerned about it. Um, my hope is that at least, you know, folks who have been able to get started and operating um, don't entirely get wiped out. But I am, you know, optimistic about uh, what it means when the Fed comes in and says, okay, let's elevate you know, the operating guidelines, let's elevate the standards, let's elevate, you know, where we are um, in these state programs, and let's, priority, let's prioritize certain things like social equity in a more meaningful way that some states have kind of only faked the funk on. Very true. And, and maybe we could even take it a step back, like you said, because legalization, decriminalization, rescheduling, like that's going to be a while from now, but do you guys, what do you guys predict with, you know, access to capital? and banking and things of that nature, do you think that maybe the federal priority will be to pass acts that are already pending before trying to do this whole full plan? You guys are both not so. Yeah. Yeah, I, some I, form. I, Go ahead. Yeah. That, yeah, I think we all hope so, right? Um, <clears throat> I, I think we could see a couple of things. Look, Safe Banking Act has passed three times in the House. It, it's overwhelmingly popular, much like cannabis is generally. Um, and, you know, to just digress for a second, like part of the, the reason why things are moving slowly federally for cannabis is it's this weird dynamic where it's, it's overwhelmingly popular. Virtually everybody in this country agrees that it should at least be decriminalized and probably legalized meaning of being regulated. Um, but it's not a top three or even five issue for almost anyone. It's, you know, we live in this bubble here in cannabis land where it's all of our number one issue. Um, or close to it. But for most people, they're like, yeah, I would love to smoke weed. That would be great. But like, it's not, you know, it's not up there on the top of my list. So, but, but everybody agrees. So that's, that's, um, you know, one thing I, I, um, I think that we can get like, I, I, I'm hopeful that safe banking passes in a COVID bill. I hope that they don't delay that just because they want to jam it into this overall legalization bill that, you know, morphs um, States Act more act, safe banking. We need banking now, right? And it's not just because we need access to capital markets, which we do. And the reason why we all need that is because we need a lower cost of capital, whether you're Cureleaf or you're a social equity applicant and or the recipient of a social equity license, um, it's impossible to raise capital if you're you know, a, a small business owner. So we all need a reduced cost of capital. Um, we need our employees to be able to get healthcare without having any trouble whatsoever. Insurance is a problem. So we need that too. Uh, we just need access to bank accounts. There will be less fraud. And guess what? The states and the federal government will collect more taxes because there won't be that much cash left. We'll also be able to distinguish between the illicit market and the legal market. When one can bank and the other cannot, it will be very clear. There will be a line of clear line of delineation. Um, hopefully they don't wait. Uh, it, it's obviously popular. It's going to get jammed in that you know, I hope it gets jammed into to, to one of these COVID relief bills, but um, it seems to be a pawn. It's been a pawn in all of these negotiations for the last year or two. Um, the other thing I would just keep an eye out for when it comes to access to capital is I am hopeful that Merrick Garland um, will eventually get confirmed as the attorney general. And one of his first acts will be to at a minimum reinstate the coal memo. Um, and hopefully not just reinstate the coal memo. And I think he will, and I think he'll do it really soon. I think it will be very quick. Uh, there's all the reason in the world to do that. that hopefully he expands upon that in a way that allows for um, meaningful access to capital markets and the lower cost of capital for the entire industry. Um, so I would keep an eye out for, for a, a, a Garland memo, a, a, you know, a, a coal memo 2.0, like soon, I hope. Does anybody else want to add before I, I switch yeah. over? To, go ahead. Yeah, the one thing I wanted to add, and it just might help to explain, we'll, we'll, 
what are some of the reasons why banks aren't lending, right? Why aren't they jumping in? And if you break it down, I mean, the Controlled Substances Act, everyone knows cannabis is Schedule I. Um, but what the Controlled Substances Act actually permits the Department of Justice to do, they can come in, seize your plants, seize your money, and seize your real property. It's in the Controlled Substances Act. And if you remember, you used to see the DEA busting up all the dispensaries in California. So why is that stopped? Obviously, policies have changed, so they're not going to act on it. But technically, right now, the only, the only reason why the DEA isn't busting up the dispensaries is the DEA and the Department of Justice get all their funding from this act called the Appro Appropriations Act. It's essentially their budget. Year over year, it gets renewed. And there was a rider that was added to the Appropriations Act that says the DOG can't use, the DOJ can't use any of their funding to actually enforce the Controlled Substances Act against certain states that have legalized medicinal cannabis is the key. So it essentially ties their hands because they can't use any money to enforce it. But the key there is that rider only applies to medicinal. It doesn't apply to adult use. So technically right now, the DEA can come in and bust up adult use dispensaries. The reason they don't do it is because of the policy changes and the different administrations that come in. But this just shows you how dysfunctional the federal program is and how they've been kicking the can down the road and not fixing this. It's terrible. Chris, you yeah. wanted to add something? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think I have a different prediction on safe banking. I, I, I mean, I'm, I, I think that safe banking, while necessary, as again, representing a company, like it, it, it would be a huge benefit. Um, I, I much more see um, both the House and Senate leadership going for a bigger uh, win. And I think that when they act on cannabis, they would want there to be a more significant victory than a banking proposal. And I say that just based on the fact of how long it takes Congress to come around to these proposals. Yes, safe banking has been well positioned. Yes, it's passed the House multiple times. Yes, even you know Mitch McConnell and others in, in the Republican uh, conference on the Senate side have expressed support or not opposition at least. Um, I see the leadership going for a more significant win and see significant safe banking actually getting kicked to the back end because of that. So that's just, uh, you know, we could revisit this in a couple months or in a year and see oh, what comes out. I, I think I agree kind of too, because they're, they're infamous for wanting to have great big headlines. Uh, and so maybe they'll wait to just do everything wrong um, instead of, you know, bit by bit, do little things properly, but hey, you know, this is the world we live in. Um, so let me let me switch to another state that's had equal turmoil. So New York, which I think everybody here has a, a lot of experience with, but maybe let's just talk about one, what's going on in New York and like, what's the difference between the MRTA and the CRTA? Um, because I feel like that that needs to be clarified a little bit. Yes, yeah, so I'll start on that. So, um, go ahead. No, somebody, you wanted to say something? Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, what is going on in New York? Yeah, Take no, that's life. a good question. Um, so, a lot of inside baseball. I'll try to make it super quick. Um, MRTA legislative proposal, CRTA executive proposal. Um, every year in January, from January to April 1st, uh, the governor uh, runs his budget. Um, it includes uh, legislative items called Article 7, basically Article 7 of the Constitution authorizes him to pass legislation or to advance legislation if there's a fiscal impact. Um, and so this is the now third year in a row that the governor has included a legalization proposal in his budget. Um, in the past, we required, you know, controversial items like raise the age, like, you um, congestion pricing or other items of significant and significant controversy to move through the budget process. Uh, we are in a different place now where Democrats hold each house with a supermajority, um, that it's not as necessary for things to go, go through the budget process. Um, that being said, uh, the governor is still quite uh, powerful in the state of New York and therefore will still try to be the driver of certain pieces of legislation. Um, the MRTA has gone through, you know, 17,000 different versions and iterations over the years, uh, many of which I was the lead drafter for. Um, and the CRTA initially was kind of a 
copy and paste with a couple of cuts from the original MRTA um, or from one of the versions of the MRTA a couple of years ago. Um, I would say to be very clear to folks on the call and listening in, the CRTA um, it does not meet the snuff of the intent of the MRTA, which is to create a diverse and equitable industry in the state of New York. Um, it is a very different proposal. Um, it, and, you know, for those of you who have seen or, or experienced uh, legislative processes or have engaged uh, with some of these bills, you recognize that, you know, the intent or the impact of a bill can change with a comma, can change with an and or an or or a shall or a may. Um, and I think that is what um, the governor's proposal does is it tries to weaken certain significant uh, pieces of the MRTA um, just to provide the governor with flexibility as he always wants and control as he always eventually gets. Um, what I would say also just a quick flag, um, some of the differences that we've seen in this proposal as well in the past proposals, there's a lack of agreement on what the future penalty should be post-legalization for cannabis related conduct, whether it be low level sale, high level sale, um, the governor has taken a more heavy handed approach than the legislature has. Um, there's a disagreement over the structure of the authorizing agency that will be, you know, handling licenses and, and, and that kind of stuff and regulations. Um, and, you know, one of the key differences there being the governor believes that he should nominate and appoint everybody who runs the commission or anybody who runs the Office of Cannabis Management and the legislature and anybody else should have no say. Um, but most importantly, to the folks on the call, uh, you know, who believe in this and who, who've advocated for legalization, um, one of the biggest differences is what happens with the money, right? And so, they, you know, the publicly, that's the thing that people have discussed, but there are hundreds of issues that are different between the MRTA and the CRTA that, you know, folks at the table right now are negotiating. And I'll go through the table part, but I wanted to you know, make some time for folks to comment on the differences between the bills before I go through kind of what the process is in New York and these things moving forward. Yeah, um, just just to add to that, um, just on a, the timeline here, we'll actually back it up a little bit further. Um, unlike New Jersey, for example, New York is not a ballot initiative state. <clears throat> Our state constitution does not allow us to put legalization um, to the voters, unfortunately. So it has to be done legislatively. And that has that is the the reason why it has taken so long. Um, the secondary reason is that no one can agree on it, and as Chris pointed out, there are some serious serious differences, meaningful differences between um, you know what the governor wants wants to see, and what some of the lawmakers want to see. You know, primarily uh, Crystal People Stokes and Liz Kruger, who um, have been uh, long long time champions of uh, legalization. So it's looking like notwithstanding the fact that we have a democrat controlled governor and government in albany uh it still probably has to get passed through the budget um having spoken to some of the democratic senators for example um you know the, there's the long island six it's democratic some of the democratic politicians in new york are pretty conservative democrats and they don't necessarily want to go out on a limb and vote for this as a standalone, but tucking it in the budget obviously makes it easier. So April 1 seems to be like the date. Um, and uh, I'm obviously pretty hopeful that it's going to pass, uh, but they need to work through a lot of these issues. First and foremost, right, the governor's bill, the CRTA does not set, does not mention at all any number or percentage of the licenses that need to be awarded to um, social and economic um, applicants right so there uh, it shouldn't be that hard to do that just put that in there right uh, it should not be that difficult give half the licenses to minority and women-owned businesses just do it right I think we're going to get there um, but who knows um, there's a couple of other key differences that I think are interesting the MRTA for example has a New York State residency requirement the CRTA does not um, that's um, a potential huge problem, right? For anybody who doesn't live in New York, it's potentially a huge boon for people who are New York residents looking to apply. Um, just something to keep in mind, the latest, and then the latest version of the governor's bill, he's removed consumption lounges and delivery entirely from the bill. Um, I'm not too concerned about that. I think it's gonna end up in the regs. I actually think that they want those things to happen and they know that those things have to happen. We need delivery in New York. It's absolutely essential, uh, particularly for New York City. If we don't have delivery, we're not gonna have a healthy market. 
Um, certainly not one that's going to be able to compete um, at all with the traditional market. So, so especially given what the proposed tax rates are going to be. So I, I'm hopeful that they're going to be very flexible about that and put that in the regs. Uh, and that's why they took it out of the bill itself. But um, who knows? Consumption lounges, I don't have a personal opinion about, but you know, obviously I think we should let them happen. Let me, um, let, me, let me just contrast that real quickly with New Jersey because what New Jersey is doing, and, and Chris, you can go back to that. I just wanted to give a quick contrast, but New Jersey does have a delivery license put in and they allow consumption spaces, but it has to be tied to one of the existing operators or to a retail license. And so it, I'm happy that they have that, but I agree like New York not doing delivery is crazy because they can't compete with the existing market. I mean, it's all delivery right now. Chris, sorry. I, go, yeah, ahead. go ahead. I, I think they're going to do it, right? Because it just was so um, bizarre to see that taken out of the bill um, that, you know, I asked somebody who, know, who knows and they, I got a very defensive answer, which was, we thought we were getting to the point where we were really putting the regs into the bill and we don't want to do that because we don't want to pigeonhole ourselves into uh, a spe specific licensing structure, a corporate structure, um, or limit anyone when it comes to delivery. They had things in there like you could only hire 25 delivery people. That doesn't really allow you to scale delivery. Um, some people have you know, opinions about whether that makes sense or not. But, but the answer was, no, we're going to put it in the regs because we don't want to be constrained by putting something in the bill that we didn't intend to. So I, I think they're gonna do it. They, they know, I mean, the lawmakers in New York, particularly people in the governor's office and certain lawmakers totally know what's going on in New York. They know the market, they're, they're, they have relationships with traditional market operators already. They should be letting them in. They should be giving them licenses and giving them, give them an opportunity right away to get licensed or not. And if you don't, good luck, we're, you know, we're gonna come after you. I think it's a decent idea, but, um, yeah, yeah I, I, no, I think I think I think you're right in that they're going to end with delivery and social consumption spaces included. And I just wanted to say this point before I forget it because it was coming on to me. And I, for folks on the call who, um, you know, who this 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 community, who folks who understand kind of what this needs to look like, understand that social equity is not it's not a program, right? And and I think that's the place where a lot of states. And, and advocates and regulators come into mistakes. It's not a program. It, it's market design. It's structure. It's, it's access. It's opportunity. It's everything. And so social consumption spaces are included in the New York bill because of the fact that we have 750,000 people who live in public housing who can't smoke at home. And the law also doesn't authorize them to smoke outside. And so when we say this is a problem, this is excluded from the bill, what we're saying is, no, no, no this is an equity issue. This is first and foremost an equity issue. And so I think that, you know, of concern to the governor's proposal currently is that he's stepped as much as he's stepped more into uh, using the talking points than he has in the past. He's also stepped, his proposal has stepped further away from what represented uh, a bill that centered and prioritized social equity. And I think that like that, that's a thing that we have to, you know, hold him accountable for and, and, and call them out for um, that the, the, the you know the the language is there, uh, but the substance of the legislation is, is not. Um, and I, I can go back into yeah, the, Chris. The, the process. Maybe maybe I'll just add similar frustration in New Jersey, right? Because our bill, the first legalization bill, didn't even include social equity in there. Like the word didn't exist. And then in the second bill, they did exactly what you said not to do, which was let's let's put tax revenue to social equity programs. Un undefined programs. We don't need the money necessarily to go all into the programs. But they need to go to help the people who are already doing this. How do we get them from Ill illegal to legal and without having the stigma attached? And how do we get them capital, right? Not only to apply for a license, but to be operate operational for, for however long, because what, 4% of businesses are successful? And people forget that when it comes to cannabis. They're like, well, I'll just go get a license and I'll, and I'll become rich. Actually, no, this is an entire business. So forget just crowdfunding and raising capital to apply. You're gonna need money to actually be a real business. And so how do we provide for that, right? This is the problem with New Jersey. We don't have funding for social equity applicants. We don't have incubator programs. There isn't even a grant application. So 
I, it's, it's a ways to go, but I think right now is the time because we haven't finalized things and these legislation right, and rules and regulations will certainly be amended for people to come and speak up now, right? Like I'm trying for anybody on this call that's interested in organizing, reach out to me, blaze responsibly, shameless plug, but we need the municipalities and, and the senators and assemblymen to listen to what the people are trying to do. Otherwise it's going to fail and it's just gonna be dominated by MSOs like it has been and it doesn't serve anybody justice. And, and this, is, this is not just an issue for New York and New Jersey. It's, a, it's an issue for every state and city that's legalized. Um, th there is, you know, th this concept of social equity um, is, you know, great in, you know, these rooms and we can all talk about it. No one has implemented a good program, right? People ask that question all the time. Who's done the best job? Literally nobody's done a good job of it. Um, why is that? And, and I know we talked about this the other day, but it, it's, it, it bears repeating. These programs are set up as a giveaway and that's not the point. The point point is not to just give somebody a license who deserves the license. Um, that doesn't get them anything, right? They should not just have an opportunity to open a business. They should have an opportunity to compete, to create intergenerational wealth, not just to have a store, but to compete in this industry. And how do you do that? You, you need money to do it, right? That's just the reality. Uh, how, how do we get that money to them? This is not an easy question to answer. I don't have a great one. Um, what I have offered and what I've proposed to the governor's office on this is that we bond the the tax revenue at the state level, meaning let's create a state bond, uh, you know, a, a fixed income instrument issued by the state of New York that anybody can invest in. And it's tax free if you're a New York resident, like, like any you know, muni bond. Um, and it's backed by cannabis uh, tax and licensing revenue. Meaning if we think we could generate $350 million a year in, 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 in tax revenue at the state um, at scale, eventually we'll get there. But why don't we raise a billion dollars as the state to today or you know at the end of the year or after the bill passes raise a billion dollars now do it today do it this year bring that money forward we need it now um and this the whole state needs it now but use some of that money um and fund social equity programs offer zero low interest lo, zero or low interest loans right offer support backstop private investment in, or non-predatory private investment support that so you can backstop some of it um you know create these incubator programs that's all great you need the money they need to be funded. How is someone who has never made more than $42,500 a year um, and has you know, been incarcerated going to raise the capital necessary to even open, open up a single dispensary? It's, it's virtually impossible. Um, they don't know the same people that those who have you know, created MSOs or created other successful businesses, they don't have that access to capital. So until you solve that problem, you don't haven't really created a program for anyone. You haven't created an opportunity for any of these license holders. It's like saying, congratulations, here's your canoe. We're going to put you down the river, but we don't have a paddle for you. So good luck. And all the white people are, you know, rolling right past you with their paddles or well, exactly. their, you know, or their jet skis. Yeah. And, and that's what, the intent of the New York program of trying to, you know, taking a couple steps back. I mean, all of these bills, ballot initiatives, you know, we drafted them around the same time, right? New York, Massachusetts, uh, California, Prop 64. These were drafted at the same time by the same people. And at, obviously New York has delayed. And so we've updated with lessons learned from those states who failed. We learned that one-to-one -one licensing is not gonna work without the, without the upfront support of app writing. We learned that, you know, from the Cali experience that tying these businesses together, equity and, and, and big business tying them together is not gonna work. And so we tried to incorporate all of those lessons learned into saying, not only are we talking about priority for access and opportunity, but we're also talking about creating a market structure that favors what we hope to be social equity advocates, create an incubator program and funding it, right? That's why we struck the deal with DROs to divert that money, right? And it was not a deal that anybody wanted to make. Yeah. You know, I know, exactly. you know, the ROs have done a service to fund this, to provide medical cannabis to the state. Nobody was interested in making that deal. We made it because we understood that we had to fund this program, otherwise it wouldn't work. And so, you know, I, I, I absolutely agree with everything Jeff just said. Sorry, Robert. But no, 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 not at all. But the one thing I can't, like I was like biting my tongue, I got to talk about Illinois because I only represented social equity applicants in Illinois, right? They had the program, the mentorship, the lending, 
I don't care what program you have, you have to implement it correctly, right? You could have everything set out there. And what happened? What? Not one social equity applicant actually got a license. I, I mean, my head exploded. So I, I think it's good that we're talking about, you know, you got to have the program. We need entry points into the industry, but man, you got to implement it. It's got to actually work. And the best thing we can do is look, like you guys said, look at these other states, look at Illinois. You could have everything laid out there, but if you don't implement it correctly, well, you're in trouble. It's not going to work. Absolutely right. Absolutely. That, and, and New York, New York's got a great opportunity to do something unique, Chris, that you touched on that we should talk about really quickly. And it, and, and, and it goes to a bigger issue here um, and answering a question someone asked about vertical integration in New York. Today, there are 10 licensed ROs in the medical market. They're re you know, registered organizations. Those are the medical license holders. There's 10 of them, nine of them are MSOs, and then there's ETAIN, that's a women's own business, uh, a women owned business. Um, they're vertically integrated, obviously. Uh, the, when, the, when the first MRTA came out, uh, the MSOs went batshit crazy because they were like, wait a minute, we're propping up your medical market and we can't be vertical. The adult use proposal dating way back, MRTA, CRTA, prohibits vertical integration. There are reasons for that that I won't go into on a recorded live discussion, but um, it's not going to be vertical for adult use. It's not going to happen, right? So, okay, well, what happens to the 10 ROs? They got into a conversation and negotiation with the state, um, and, and I think it's a rather elegant solution to a somewhat unrelated issue, which we were talking about, which is social equity funding. Um, some or all of that money should and hopefully will be used to fund some of these social equity programs with zero interest loans. It's a way to intermediate um, the MSO's financial involvement with the social equity world um, without them exerting any control over it. And, and it's a really good solution. It seems it's probably only gonna work in New York because of the, the construct and the framework that we're working in. Um, this situation doesn't exist anywhere else uh, where you have 10 vertically integrated operators in the state who are gonna be printing money for the first three years. I mean, printing money. Um, they're already up and running. We have 19 million people here. We consume 77 metric tons of cannabis a year in New York City, uh, 10 cultivators. Uh, so for them, if they have to drop 20 million bucks for the right to be the, one of the only 10 vertically integrated operators, it, they're gonna make it back in three weeks. So it's not a big number if, the, if that's the number, um, which is great. That's not going to be enough money to finance um, social equity. But again, this goes back to someone's question they asked about what's vertical integration going to look like. It's not going to look like anything. The 10 medical operators will be vertical and that will be it. You will be able to cultivate and process and maybe be a distributor, which is interesting. Um, I think they were leaving the distribution lane uh, for some other people uh, initially, but I think they're going to lose that battle. But if you own retail, you cannot have any financial interest, direct or indirect, with anybody um, with a cultivation or manufacturing or a distro license. Jeff, I'm glad you brought that up because I, let me contrast to what New Jersey is doing. Similarly, the 12 existing vertically integrated medical operators, they're all grandfathered in. So they get to do adult use sales whenever that happens. And the adult use market will not be vertically integrated for the first two years. So you could hold cultivation and manufacturing, but you can't have retail, vice versa. And so they're doing that. If, because... <laughs> it's idiotic, right? Because we know that it should be the opposite, right? Just right. maybe permit vertical integration for the first two, three years, make this thing work, and then maybe split it off. Because the biggest risk to the market is in the first couple of years, the supply chain management, anyone who's come near the California market knows is it's just an epic disaster everywhere. And the only way to really survive financially is to be vertically integrated in many of these jurisdictions. Um, we're not gonna see it here in New York, but that, that doesn't mean there isn't massive opportunity. There is, but uh, it's gonna look very different. It's also going to open up the state to a tremendous amount of corruption. Um, the conversations around how do we, how do we get control financially or otherwise, if we're a retail license holder, how do we get control? And the answer is everyone has asked me, my answer is you cannot do it. There is no way to do it. The bill is so broad that you can't have a relationship with anyone um, who is on the other side of the supply chain. Yeah, so I so think it's there will be a lot of handshake deals. A lot of handshake deals. That's what we've been seeing happening in the industry, right? Unfortunately, and that's why it's so difficult for the normal person to get into this industry because unless you have a lobbyist or you know you're already in the game and you have contacts, it's very difficult. And so, what 
let's let's try to let's try to get on a higher note <laughs> because it's clear that New York, New Jersey, East Coast, a lot of states have not been doing the right thing. But maybe you know, are there states or districts like that have been doing the right thing, or can we point to anything? Um, you know, DC is a really weird market. I, I don't know what's going on in DC. I know Chris knows a little bit about DC or maybe PA, but why don't we switch and see like what can the East Coast learn from other provinces that have done this? Well, I'll talk about PA real quick because there are some certain things about PA that I really like. I think PA's Achilles heel are their tax structure, right? It's like 6%, two years later, steps up to 12, then to 19. I don't know what kind of adult use market you're putting out of business with a tax rate like that. And if you think you're going to wipe out the adult use market in two years or even four, you're kidding yourself. But having said all that, on the positive side, some of the nice things that PA has is straight off the bat, home grow. You know, we've had to fight and advocate for that in New Jersey. PA has it right away. The other thing I like about PA, which we talked about earlier, is, you know, this is a tough business, right? And those first couple of years are critical. It's make or break. Well, PA has this sliding scale of fee structure, and it's based on your revenue. So listen, if you have a hard year, they're not going to hit you for a fee to keep your license. That's, you know, it's a sliding scale. I think that's something that other states can really look at and learn from. Um, the other thing I love about it is PA tax dollars go straight to one of the things is student loan forgiveness. And I think anybody on this call who hears that can definitely get behind that because that kind of speaks to the younger generation and what everybody is going through. Most people are saddled with student loan debt and they're like, hey, let's plug it right in there. So um, I, I really, and, and another great thing is we talk on this call, right, about threshold issues, right? One of the biggest threshold issues, of course, financing. The other one is securing real estate, super expensive. Shirali and I, you know, we have clients who've been holding on to real estate for over a year. It's out of control and a lot of people can't do that. Pennsylvania, control your real estate is not one of the items you need to show pre, pre-application. You know, so it shows that they're thinking, right? And I think there's a lot of good things here. And, um, you know, Jeff mentioned earlier, everybody always asks me like which state got it right. No one has got it right yet, but certain states have gotten certain aspects that I like. I'm waiting for somebody to put it all together and I can't wait to point to a state and say, man, they got it right. Yeah, that's what I'm waiting for too. I know. What about let's can we can we talk has massachusetts done anything right <laughs> they've been in the headlines a lot recently but um what or or maybe mention what they did wrong so we can make sure that it doesn't happen in the other states that have to do it yeah yeah well i mean mass had the first minority owned business right on the east coast i mean that's something to celebrate uh, it's sad that we have to say oh they have one that's great they were the first to do it but listen uh you know I, I, that was a positive you know and you got to build on these positives let it snowball to something bigger yeah, and I think learning lessons, maybe we can learn how not to do host agreements. So that Yes, not- absolutely. Don't call it a vacation fund or something different and try to collect more money from people just by renaming it something different. So, you know, we learn from every state's mistakes, right? Chris, I, you- yeah, I, I think I New think York. Think, uh, <laughs> oh, just it's a quick note on Massachusetts in terms of positive. I mean, I think the, uh, not initially, but eventually, and currently, I guess the, amount of public um, insight and input into the commission and, and how they're making their decisions. And I guess that's something that's been helpful. You know, you know, Shanita Penny, Shanita Penny, <laughs> Shailene Title, also Shanita Penny is a big advocate. Shailene Title, uh, uh, it was a rock star commissioner. She just stepped off the board, but you know, it was a really um, kind of eventually grew to be a more open process than what we've seen from other states. And I think that's something that everybody should be looking at as we spoke to the importance of implementation. Absolutely. Jeff? Shanita for commissioner. <laughs> um, I would endorse it. Um, like the, the um, I, look, Mass, we need to give out, I don't know what New York's going to look like. It's, it's so strange because it's, it's, it's this unique experiment where no one, really no one's going to be vertically integrated except for the MSOs. But we just need to strike a balance, um, you know, with supply and demand, right? Um, no one wants to pay a hundred dollars for an eighth. They're not going to. They're they're going to keep going to whatever source they have. Um, it's just not going to work. But um, you know, at the same time, we've seen 
the perils of, of uh, you know, overbuilding a state and overspending on cultivation capacity. And, you know, Canada's literally burning weed. Um, that's a different issue in Canada, but, uh, or look at Oregon, um, or, you know, a lot of people are thriving in Oklahoma, but it's kind of a shit show there. Uh, it's great if, you know, you're, you're into the scene in Oklahoma, but um, what New York needs to do uh, to have a remotely successful program, I think, among other things, we need to expedite and prioritize cultivation capacity licensing right out of the gate. We have across the 10 ROs, 350,000 square feet of cultivation capacity. And that's just the size of the facility. That's not canopy. Um, Massachusetts, for example, uh, by contrast, has roughly 3 million square feet of cultivation capacity in a state of 7 million. And wholesale prices are still around for, you know, they're over 4,000 a pound. They're four to 4,500 a pound. It's expensive. So when it hits the shelf, it's, it's 64. Um, comes out, you know, you're still paying a lot, right? It's, expen it's an expensive state. Um, New York has 19 million people in it and 350,000 square feet of capacity. So they need to get people licenses so that those people can go out and raise the capital and build the infrastructure for cultivation and manufacturing. Um, because you can give out all the retail licenses you want. You can give out all of the social equity delivery or retail licenses you want. There won't be anything for them to sell um, unless we get those, uh, unless we get cultivation online fast and in a very, very big way. So it's one thing we can avoid, whether that's going to happen, uh, I have my doubts, but uh, people need to get well, built out. Also- Jeff, to your point, I mean, you mentioned, oh, sorry, sorry, I should have... I was just gonna say, what about automatic expungements? Like how about if we're gonna go ahead and legalize an entire industry, why, don't, why doesn't step one, like helping the people who are behind bars, how are we gonna address that? And then the ones that are already pending conviction. And then, you know, like, I feel like that always- We, is we should. Right, it should. But it's and not as easy, like, but it's not as easy as, it's not that easy, right? And I'm not trying to like, you know, you know, just rain on the parade on that. Cause I agree with you, it, it, it should be easy. Uh, and it absolutely is necessary, but we get into these really, really rough areas about, um, well, we're going to expunge nonviolent cannabis crimes. Well, what's a nonviolent cannabis crime? I asked somebody in the DA's office about that as a friend of mine. I was like, there's so many people in prison in New York, you know, for nonviolent cannabis crimes. And she's like, there's literally no one. What are you talking about? No one. And I'm like, uh, what are you talking about? And she said, you have, to, you understand that when a kid gets arrested in the Bronx, if he touches the cop, right? We don't need to like, you know what happens. He doesn't get charged with possession of a dime bag. He gets charged with resisting arrest. He gets charged with all kinds of other bullshit, whether or not he touched the cop. We know that that's how our system works right now. So how do you define a nonviolent cannabis crime, right? Does resisting arrest count? Does having a registered firearm count? If he wasn't doing it, you know, there, there are so many variables here that might not lead to the, res the result that we are all looking for. Uh, that and, and it's concerning, but it needs to be addressed. So all the more reason that it's a priority because we need to work through those issues now. Um, it can't be limited to nonviolent cannabis crimes. We have to define what that means because a lot of the violent cannabis crimes are obviously not violent at all. Yeah, I mean, the, the distinction between nonviolent and violent in New York State is not a real thing um, in terms of offenses. So, I mean, we, we did pass, um, we had to create, expungement did not exist in New York before last year. We had to create an expungement statute, which we did um, when I was still in the legislature when we passed the, uh, the decrim bill to close the public view loophole. We included a statute that created expungement in, other, in, in the state of New York. And so it was a blanket expungement for the lowest level possession offenses. The MRTA carries that expungement over to the lowest level sale offenses and the rest of the uh, possession offenses uh, does not carry over to the higher level sale offenses while it does provide for resentencing and reclassification of the offense. Now, I absolutely agree it should be a part of every proposal. It needs to be a thing. And when we built the campaign, the three things that we said that we have to have are clearance of records, a diversity and inclusive uh, industry being created, and a direct you know, direct, directing of, of revenue. Um, so it, it absolutely should be a starting point. But I wanted to just kind of layer on what I said earlier about equity being an entire, it, it is more than a program. And so we learned from the states like Colorado and Washington state that had 
you know, offense exclusions, licensing exclusions based on, you know, criminal records, based on, you know, misdemeanor, felonies, whatever, um, and made sure that it was not only not a, a symptom that could disqualify you for holding a license, but it couldn't even be considered. And, you know, I think that's also part of the conversation um, as something that is central to every legalization proposal that moves forward. We are seeing the inclusion of automatic expungements or sealing or some type of, you know, uh, revisiting of criminal offenses in all the states that are moving, um, Maryland, Virginia, uh, DC, you know, federal legislation, all of the states are including some form of, of repairing that criminal, you know, the criminal uh, harm that's been done. Um, but, you know, I just wanna make sure that people understand it's also central to creating an equitable industry because the people who've been impacted, the people who have these records, sometimes are the best growers that you'll find. Sometimes not, but also they should be able to participate because of the experience that record is not just, it's a resume, it's part of their resume. And so I just wanted to flag that. And, and and a, again, a practical matter. And again, this goes back to like having an idea, implementing, a, having a program and then actually implementing it. The issue with the automatic expungement, which by the way, I mean, we should easily have is not all court records are electronic, right? You have a lot of court records that are still paper, right? So you need to get people together. You need to get these paper documents scanned in. So you actually have a, a database to do the, or implement the automatic expungement. And that takes time. It takes people and it takes dollars to do it. So yeah, we have to do it, but we still have a lot of work to do if we're going to make automatic expungements, because you just got to get the records in order because they're all over the place. Absolutely. And that's a great point because New Jersey did proceed with you know, putting together automatic expungements, but they're working right now with the AOC and the courts, and there's a lot yeah. of parties involved to do exactly that, to automize this so that it's easier for people. Exactly, because yeah. you don't want people yeah. to have to pay for attorneys, because that, again, is a social equity issue, right? If you have to hire anybody, even someone who's figured out to streamline the process and you have to pay any dollars, that's something that's just unacceptable. Yeah. And then even after we get the expungements done, making sure that the reporting agencies have correct documentation and people yep. are still being barred from employment because of a faulty record. And so it's a long process. And I just, you know, we're, we're working there and I'm happy that's being included in more states as part of the initial conversation. Yeah, it seems like the overarching theme and tone of tonight has been everything is a work in progress and everybody here is trying to do the right thing and, and hopefully we'll get there, but it's going to take time. Um, why don't we, there was a few questions in the Q&A. Are you guys, you guys ready to answer some of those questions? Um, I don't know if Cherish is here anymore, but she asked, any more details about delivery? So I, I could speak for New Jersey at least. There is, a, whenever adult use does pass the, the law, there is a category to apply for a delivery license. What that looks like, what the regulations are, are all to be determined. And so that's, that's the extent of New Jersey, but maybe if you guys want to comment on New York or another state, um, she didn't provide more details, but. Yeah, I, just quickly, I, it, as I mentioned before, the, you know, the governor removed the, the, the governor's office, removed delivery entirely from the CRTA in this latest draft. I, I do think it's going to be in there, though. I think it's just I think I really do believe them when they say they want it to be more flexible. So they're going to put it in the regs as a result. Um, the way it has been proposed, at least I think in the MRTA and in the prior version in the CRTA was there is standalone delivery and there is a delivery permit that you can attach to your retail license, which is great. So if you have a store in Manhattan, you can be running, you know, you could do the math. Uh, the MRTA had, uh, I think it's 25 people or you could have 25 delivery people um, working for you. And if you run some basic math on 25 people working 10 hours a day doing two runs an hour, which is slow with an $80 basket size, you're looking at like $11 million in revenue if you could run just 25 people in delivery. It's wildly lucrative. So um, I certainly hope they do it. Standalone delivery is pretty cool. I love the idea. Um, how that gets implemented, where it will be successful is I think all TBD. And there's, you know, it, it's complex. It's not easy uh, to figure that out. But I think it's, I, I think it's, almost a certainty that it happens and it has to in New York. Um, we get everything delivered in New York. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I wish we had that yeah. in New Jersey. Yeah, it's echo. I mean, I think fully agree with Jeff, it's gonna be included. Um, the intent was to make sure that, you know, folks 
if we're creating, if we're trying to prop up the dispensaries, folks who have, you know, places where they can sell their product, where they can get their product to across the boroughs or across the state, however um, they, you know, however big of a network they can establish. I think the only thing that was TBD was how broad the standalone delivery would go. Um, and I think the last draft had that 25 limit, but I don't, I don't, that's not a firm, firm uh, <laughs> number. I think it's yeah. more so, you know, there's space for, think about it this way, there's a space for Uber Eats and the Chinese food store uh, to do their thing. And, you know, the, we don't, we're being very intentional about creating in this industry. So we don't want it to be a big tech giveaway, but at the same time, the infrastructure that's required, the time and, and you know, logistics that are required, we understand that it's going to be really difficult to keep the big players out. So, you know. Thanks, guys. Um, we, we, I feel like we kind of answered this one in conversation, but I want to at least read out the question, which was, how can minorities even stand up against bigger com companies and individuals with seemingly unlimited capital just to even help? just even get help to compile a competitive application or thousands of dollars, not including the actual license fee. You know, that's... I, no one has unlimited capital in cannabis, I'm sorry. I, and, I, and, and I hear your point, like I think we've spoken about it. It's illegal. Uh, uh, anyone who has tried to raise money in this industry knows, the, knows that it is really tough, really, really, really difficult. No one has unlimited capital, that's coming. We will get there. We'll probably see a bubble in public markets. I think it's almost a guarantee that we'll see something like that. Um, but you know, it makes you wonder about who's advocating for the Safe Banking Act and leveling the playing field. Um, think about that for a minute. But um, how do you stand them up? Like I think we talked about that, right? We we need access. You need access to to uh, really low cost of capital funding. Um, get get money into people's hands and get them trained. And if they've never run a business before, they need the business training, but they need the money too probably more than anything. There are plenty of big companies out there uh, in the US and Canada uh, that don't have strong leadership at all and have never run businesses, certainly not a cannabis business and probably don't belong in, in a management role either. Uh, so, you know, access to capital is essential. Yeah, and, and to that point you brought up about the team, because I think outside of capital, what makes a business successful is execution and that comes from the team. So what's something that you can do right now to stand up to the bigger companies, create the best fucking team possible. Sorry for my language, but that's something you can do, right? Because you know, people, you might be somebody who's in the legacy market or you, you might have a, a family member who's, I don't know, has a finance background, put together your organizational structure so that when it is time, you at least have a team that you can work with and help you assemble the application so that you don't have to hire so many outside consultants and vendors. Maybe you can do a lot of it in-house. It's just my opinion. 100% agree. There are ways to save on costs. And a lot of people will call up and they're like, well, me and my partner, that's not going to do it. You need to take a strong look at that application and say, okay, okay, I got a gap here. How do I fill that? And the way you fill that is you network, you meet people in this industry, and then you find people who you jive with. It's a marriage and you come together and that's how you fill those voids in your application. And this is these application processes, this is roll up your sleeves. Nobody's going anywhere from the day the RFA comes out until the day it's submitted. And you can't do that alone. You know, you, you need a great team. And that's just a great point, Charlie. I just want to follow up on that. Yeah, thanks. Um, we have a few more minutes. I got, I got a little um, text, but let's, we can answer a few more questions. Where can New York people go for cannabis education, like becoming a cultivator or extractor being in the lab? Anywhere in New York? Any Cal California. You get on an airplane. You have to go to California. <laughs> yeah, and, I mean, and you, go ahead. Go ahead and, and it's a good question because it shows your head's in the right place because I can't tell you any people who say, you know, I'm a lawyer, I'm an accountant, now I want to go grow cannabis. Don't do that. You know, take something, either take something you're already good at and pivot to cannabis that's where I've seen people re be really successful or like everybody said, get on a plane, go take a job, learn how the business works, learn how the process works, educate yourself. And what does that do? That beefs up your application. You have that experience. Then when you come back home and you apply, you're going to fill that void, right? On the experience, which, which is a huge part of the application. 100%. That's absolutely correct. And it's not that expensive, actually, because of COVID. The tickets are cheap. So <laughs> now's the time to do it. Colorado, 
people are very friendly out there. I did that. I just randomly met operators and started learning. And you'd be surprised people are really willing to help you out there. And so just try, you know, don't give up. Um, and then there's, there's one, um, let's do one more question for, oh, and somebody mentioned Oaksterdam University has certificate courses in business and horticulture online. Coursera has some courses. Greenflower has like a program. So just, you know, you could probably learn, but hands-on real experience is where you're going to get the best, you know, bang for your buck. Um, all right. So California took years to get an infused restaurant. How do we get infused restaurants running from day one? Well, they have to be another license type. That's well, going to probably be you know, consumption large. Yeah, it's a it's, it's social consumption. Um, the the challenge is so it doesn't speaking for New York um, specifically. We don't speak to it in the bill, um, but one thing that would be allowed, you know, a an infused restaurant would be allowed is a social consumption license um, attached to a dispensary or not attached. Um, additionally, though, there is a prohibition on shared licensing with alcohol and cannabis and so that would be kind of the choice that you have to make do we serve alcohol do we serve infused uh infused food food or beverages so yeah thanks okay well so i i want to get us wrapped up i do want to shout out revel jacoby lulu can inclusive thank you guys for hosting this platform the series for the community this is all about education um i'm sure everybody here is willing to help at least have a conversation with you so just don't be scared to reach out to us individually. Uh, my name's Shirelli again, Blaze Responsibly. Chris, Jeff, Rob, any last you know, remarks for before we get going? The last thing I was gonna say is the fact that you're on this call means you're doing the right thing. You're educating yourself, you're getting involved, you're learning as much as possible. Soak it up like a sponge. Reach out to everyone on this panel. Uh, I'm sure our information is gonna be shared. We are resources for you. Feel free to reach out. 100%. Jeff, Chris. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll echo that, you know, reach out. And if you truly care about <clears throat> um, where this industry goes in, in New York and New Jersey, and you want to have an impact and you, you want to put your print on this business, um, speak up now, call your local representatives, have your voice heard. There's, there's, there will never be an opportunity like this in our lives to um, try to influence policy and legislation and the doors are open. You can meet with these people on Zoom and you can call them and have educated conversations and have your voice heard if you feel strongly about uh, you know, policy. Yes, and to that, now, end, if you don't know- Now where, is the time. If you don't know where the meetings are happening, Google the city, the town you live in, look at their council calendar and sign up virtually to show up to these virtual meetings and get your voice heard like Jeff said. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I mean, if you're in New York, um, there's a campaign running, as I mentioned several times, uh, smart-ny.com is the website. You can go to their Facebook page, their Instagram. They held, they held a virtual lobby day today where elections came on and demanded that the legislature move the MRTA um, before stepping back to the table to negotiate with the governor. Um, you know, this thing is changing as we speak. You know, these these... Some of these ideas are stuff that people are just throwing up against the wall and trying to see what can, what can work and what can we really achieve the best industry. Um, you all are in a great position to benefit um, as you're you know already in the learning process. I would also just add that like you know as folks said earlier, like the licensing process, it's not an easy process. It is very difficult to you know step into this space and be successful. Um, but the fact that you're already here means you're already ahead of the curve. So you know this. Let's get it done, and, and I'm here to be a resource for folks as, as, as you move forward in this. Thank you, guys. It was, an, it was an honor being on this panel with you guys. I appreciate you. Thank you to Jacoby on the Revel, Lulu, once again. And Oscar, I think you're going to drop some beats. <laughs> yeah.